You may be thinking of going for a pleasant short walk in the country this weekend, or perhaps a longer hike. You may even be planning off as Dyke, the Pennine Way, or Wainwright's Coast to Coast. I for one assume that I can just slip on my walking gear, and off I go to enjoy the fresh air, the scenery, the company, and that feeling of well-being that walking brings. Kristen will never ever enjoy that feeling. Ten-year-old Kristen has hypertonic cerebral palsy and will never be able to enjoy what we able-bodied walkers enjoy and take for granted. Kristen's life is by regular standards unbelievably restricted and she cannot sit up without support nor does she have full control of her arm movements. That Sunday morning stroll in the country will never ever happen for her. However, Kristen and others at her school do enjoy the freedom of weightlessness movement in a pool. We know she's happy because although she cannot talk, her little face lights up with a wonderful smile. Unfortunately, the pool they use is frequently too cold and is not purpose-built for disabled children. We need your help. Actually, we need your money. Kristen's school, the Clare School in Norwich, is raising money to build a hydrotherapy pool, which will be used by the school and other disabled people. Kristen's dad, Mitch, who's not a regular walker, and I, walked the Wainwrights Coast to Coast 200 miles in five days this summer in an attempt to raise money for the pool. Whilst walking those 40 miles, we did not have much time to sightsee, rest or enjoy the scenery. We did experience pain and discomfort, but we think it's a tiny price to pay. Please help us by sponsoring us and giving as much as you can to help the faces of Kristen and her friends light up. You can go on to our Just Giving page. Thank you very much. On day one we set off and we had a spring in our step and there was a jocularity in our banter. We got past Ennerdale Water in good time and Loft Beck was a tough but manageable climb but at the slate mine at Honister we were still chirpy. From Rossweight on it became very tough. It was very warm and we ran out of water and resorted to drinking from streams. Now at the Honister slate mine <laughs> And look, and look, Mitchell's in a train. It's a, it's, it's a very nice little train. Dun, 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 dun. Greener Page was a big challenge. We arrived there at about 7 p.m. We remember saying, it's all downhill from here. It was all downhill, and it was incredibly sore on the toes and the knees. We stumbled painfully into Eastdale and eventually got to the Traveller's Rest pub at 10 to 10, having walked just under 45 miles. We ate at 10.20 and Neil promptly threw up at 10.40. He was past eating, his body just couldn't take the food. Eventually, after showering and prepping for day two, we got to sleep by midnight. So day two started after we'd had just a very short sleep. However, we were tired, but we were up and out and at it by 5.40am. Sandwiches for breakfast as we walked. Up Great Tongue and onwards to Patterdale. Up Kidsty Pike and it was another very hot day. We started to struggle around Horsewater but battle on towards Shap where we lunched regally at the co-op. From Shap onwards things really started to get tough and our legs were not working as they should be. We both fell over several times trying to manoeuvre over stiles. We were eating as we walked maintaining our strength with a variety of savoury and sweet flapjacks. We eventually got to our B&B at Brownburg in time for late lasagna. To avoid feeling ill, we didn't even have a beer. Day three was again a beautiful morning and things looked good. We were stiff and we were tired, but we were still optimistic. The sun went in and we were initially grateful that it was cooler. We were also greatly relieved to be past Keld and the halfway point. In Keld, we met some Americans who told us they were also doing the coast to coast, but by bus. We marched on and stopped at Muka to grab some lunch. We took a wrong turning, wasted 45 minutes, but eventually we took the Highmore path to Reith. This meant we were bound to come down continuously into Reith. And whilst this walk into Reith was on tarmac, and not bumpy underfoot, our feet and toes had blistered and were really hurting. By the time we got to Richmond, we were in a lot of pain, and our three mile an hour pace had gone completely out of the window. 
So day four arrived and amazingly we were up on time, but we felt shattered before we'd even started. Our feet were covered in compedes and we were crammed full of painkillers, including the dreaded ibuprofen. The pain was just constant, despite the terrain being relatively flat and the temperature cooler. It had started to rain. This part of the coast to coast is quite boring, but we woke up as we diced with death, crossing over the A172. This was some challenge as running was not an option. Conversation had completely ceased, but we were still civil with each other. Video and photo taking had become neglected. When we got to our accommodation, some lads said it had taken them nearly three days to walk from Richmond and their feet were hurting. How we chuckled. Shane had a rigor at one of the tables and was shaking uncontrollably. He went freezing cold and had to go and lie down as he was completely overcome with exhaustion. His right foot was red and balloon-like and sepsis was suspected. After a meal, we settled down to a long and rejuvenating five and a half hour sleep. So day five had come, the last day. We were up and away by 5.30 and we fought the pain and tiredness. The disused railway track on Farndale and High Blakey Moor is a dull part of the coast to coast, but we were glad of it, as it is flat and it is even. Even little ups and downs were difficult. Climbing up to Sneeton Low Moor is a small incline in reality, but this day it seemed like a mountain. We were beginning to hate this whole encounter, and even when we saw the sea, and we knew we were not far off Robin Hood's Bay, we didn't really show any emotion at all, as we were nearly dead on our feet, or what was left of them. The final descent in Robin Hood's Bay was one of the most excruciating experiences either of us had ever encountered. We had carried little stones all of the way from the sea on the west coast, as tradition proposes, and we should have thrown them into the sea on the east coast. We were so tired, we just simply forgot. We did manage a couple of pints before they called last orders, and we got into our beds. So here we are, and it's late, and we're in Robin Hood's Bay, and behind us you can see the Bay Hotel, and that's always at the North Sea. Anyway, I don't, I don't know. we're going for a pint. We're going, for, we're going for we're going for pint. So after it was all over, what did I think? We had trained, but we had not trained enough. We had really underestimated the ascents and the descents and the cumulative mileage. This was the third time I'd done the coast to coast. I did it in 2011, and it took us 12 days, and it was great. We saw the scenery, and we got in at reasonable times to eat and sleep. In 2013, I took seven days at 30 miles a day. Then I was very tired and had small blisters on day six and seven. There is just an amazing and an incredible difference between 30 miles a day and 40 miles a day. Just unbelievable. We also did these 40 miles a day on five and a half to six hours sleep a day. Mitch's Fitbit shows we walked closer to 45 miles than 40 on day one and burnt up 8,000 odd calories. This shows just how hard it is to do this sort of mileage in a day and then to repeat it back to back for five days. What started off as an adventure actually ended up as a bit of a nightmare. It was, however, for a great cause, the Clare School in Norwich. Our raw feet will mend and we will be able to walk again pretty soon. We walked for young people who may never, ever walk. Please give to our Just Giving page and make this all worthwhile. Thank you.